Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me for conversations on character, community, and crisis. This series is part of the Virtues and Vocations Initiative at Duke University, which seeks to make character, purpose, and meaning central to education, pre-professional and professional education in particular. My name is Suzanne Shanahan, and I direct the Keenan Institute for Ethics, the institutional home for the series. Uh, before we begin, a brief note on logistics. There are two bits here um, to note. First, there are lots of people behind the scenes uh, working on the tech of this particular production. So if there happen to be any difficulties, they will swiftly move in to address them. The second point is that today's guest and I will talk for about 40 minutes together, and then we are going to open it up to Q&A. Uh, the Q&A, your questions will be filtered um, to me, and I will pose them to the speaker directly. So with that, uh, I am simply delighted to introduce Nancy Kane on character and leadership in a crisis. Uh, welcome, Nancy. Nancy F. Kane is a celebrated historian at the Harvard Business School, where she holds the James E. Robeson Chair of Business Administration. Professor Kane is an internationally acclaimed thought leader, best known for her path-breaking research on courageous leadership and how leaders past present craft their lives of purpose, worth, and impact. Her latest book, Forged in Crisis, The P Power of Courageous Leadership in Turbulent Times, spotlights how five of history's greatest leaders managed crises and what we can each learn from their experience. She is also author of too many other books to count. Um, I would also note she is an avid and accomplished equestrian. Welcome, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Suzanne. Pleasure to be here. It's great to have you here. Um, first, uh, a brief note on the game plan for our conversation today. So your book first came out in 2017, um, where leadership globally looked a bit lackluster. Um, it has reemerged as a must COVID read. Uh, it has been on many book lists about pandemics, plagues, and crises. Uh, but also, perhaps more importantly, because I, like lots of people at this moment, are thinking that if we had more robust, effective, competent, empathetic leadership, we may be moving more quickly um, toward resolving this particular crisis. Um, I think many of us for, are grasping for how to make sense of this moment and to understand what we need to do to move beyond this moment in terms of uh, both what we much, most, much, east, much, what we should each do mm -hmm. and what we should expect of leadership. Um, and I think for me personally, the five narratives um, have been really inspiring, but also just a great fun read uh, to learn little bits and pieces of things. So what I'm hoping is we can do three things. First, let's just uh, explore a little bit about uh, your argument, uh, connecting the dots of crisis and leadership through the life stories, looking at leadership and character, uh, and then talk a little bit about um, professional education before turning to a question of this current moment and whether your argument is evolving, um, whether you see any exemplars of leadership right now. Uh, and then I just want to play a little bit with some of the ideas in a kind of rapid fire round uh, to close. Um, so let's talk about what leadership actually is. Um, really interestingly, you start with the John Foster Wallace definition of leadership, which is uh, inspiring and attainable, but there are bazillions of definitions of leadership. Why this one in particular? So for just for our listeners who don't know, oh, David Foster Wallace's um, comment about leadership made in a Rolling Stone article, incidentally, in 2000 that he wrote when he was following John McCain around on the campaign bus at the time uh, in his first run for the presidential election. He riffs in this very interesting uh, article called Up Simba, if you want to read it, about leadership. And he ends up talking about about the phenomenon of what, why do we trust leaders and what is it, a, what's a real leader? And he comes up in a David Foster Wallaceian way, comes up with this definition after a lot of, if you will, prologue, uh, real leaders are individuals who help us overcome the limitations of our own weaknesses, 
selfishness, laziness and fears and get us to do harder, better things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. Uh, leaders or individuals who help us push through the boundaries of weakness, selfishness, laziness, fears, and get us to do better, harder things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. And I just thought this was so compelling. And I thought it not only summarized, kind of summed up or captured a lot of what I had read about and been attracted to and and interested in as a, as a student of leadership. I, I stumbled on this many years ago in 2000 and five um and but also it it's it struck me personally i thought of the teachers or the you know a tennis coach back in my life a mentor at H harvard business school that just that they were they were leaders for me because they did help me push through some boundaries and do harder better things and i could have than i could have done without their presence without their impact so it just it, it just stuck in my claw and i kept playing with it and I came to write that part of the book at the very end of the book. I wrote the introduction to the book at the end of the book. So I was pretty sh I had really vetted it with my people, my fabulous five, as my editor at Scribner called my, uh, my leaders. Um, and I vetted it with myself. So <clears throat> one of the things I like about the, uh, the, your definition is that for each of us who is not Abraham Lincoln, right, um, right that it, it is attainable. It gives us something to work toward as individuals. And you really push back on this notion that leaders are born and really talk about how crisis is a formative um, moment for them. I, are, there, right, are there individuals who cannot be forged in crisis? Yeah. Um, right, are there people who in this particular crisis you see as failing at this formative opportunity? And how might we sort of avoid those pitfalls so, thinking about leadership? So great question. So, um, you know, I, I argue very, very hard. And this is actually in some ways an argument against some of the teaching and even compensation practices in American executive compensation, I think, which I think have been horrendously destructive over the last 30 years. You pay people like they're sprung from the rib of Zeus, like they're, they're born incredibly special. That's just not the case. And in all my research, leaders are made, and they're made by a combination of mileage, experience, and nature, nurture and nature. Um, and then they're forged in particularly significant ways in crisis. And they can be forged in two ways, right? They either get better or they wither. Uh, let me say, try to unpack that. So what seems to happen in crises, and I've, damn, I've been studying them for a long time. Uh, not, I didn't start out to study crises. I set out to study leaders who suddenly, you know, became so much more luminous and resilient and serious about a purpose. And ultimately, as a result of that work, you know, is successful in, in their impact on a worthy mission. Um, but this is what seems to happen. And let me just start with a quote from Lincoln back in uh, 1862. So this was his annual message to Congress. Things are not going well. It's December of that year for the Union Army. And he says, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. And that, I think, is a very good metaphor for what happens in a crisis, right? All the old templates stop working so well. Most of them stop working at all, right? Uncertainty reigns. Stakes get much higher, much faster. In a long-term crisis, like the kind I study, like COVID, right? This is not a hurricane, as terrible as those destructive events are. This is not, you know, Three Mile Island. This is and where we're going to get through it, clean up, and learn. These are long, long-term crises, the Civil War. In the case of Rachel Carson, metastasizing cancer and 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 environmental sustainability, um, and 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 what seems to happen is people realize I don't have the old, I don't have the old ways, and I don't have the old playbooks, and I don't have the old models, and my and the ground is shifting underneath my feet. Holy moly! I got to figure out how to raise the level of my game, and this is the really interesting thing, Suzanne. They do it first within themselves, like a leader. Shackleton is a great example. He's the first story in the book. Ernest Shackleton, an explorer, ends up trapped on the ice when his boat, his boat is crushed by the ice in 1915. He spends almost two years floating on an iceberg before, just to use a visual aid, before he uses, he, he rigs up a lifeboat. This is a replica of the 24-foot lifeboat, the James Cairn that he sailed 
in the in the spring of 1916, 800 miles from the coast of uh, the island off the coast of Antarctica to a little whaling station island in the South Atlantic, and eventually rescues his men against all odds. So with, with Shackleton, it's really clear. He's like, I got to do something. The boat is the boat is crushed, and he first figures out how am I going to rise within myself to try and get my men alive, and then how am I going to help them believe they can get themselves, they can get them, we can get ourselves home alive, and so crises are like greenhouses. People, individuals either, and this is true whether you're leading a big group or leading a family or leading a library or leading a, 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 a an institute at Duke, they, they either rise, you're like, I'm gonna make something good of this, I don't know exactly how, it's gonna be a lot of improvisation, we're gonna navigate point to point, but I'm, I'm gonna steal my muscles, my core muscles, put my shoulders back and do something with myself and in this chaotic world, or they wither. They hunker down, imagine, you know, all of us with our phones hunker down, I'm using this metaphorically, hunker down and hope that it blows over. Um, so so that's, what, that's just what, what happens in crises. And it, it's a very bifurcated distribution. Some people rise and some don't. And I mean, we've seen that in, with COVID, right? We see Andrew Cuomo, who no one was looking at as a courageous leader uh, nine months ago. Suddenly, I've, been watch, I've watched almost every one of his press briefings kind of getting better and better by the day through late March, April, May, into June, now into July. We're not, that's not coming back to my state. Uh, and then we see people like, you know, Governor Rick DeSantis in Florida, who's who's hunkering down, yep. right in with this, he can kind of keep, keep business as usual at extraordinary cost, scared, defensive, a smaller version of who he could be. And, and, and it's, it's just, it's, it, I don't, I can't explain it perfectly, but that's, that's about the the map I see over and over and over again. So I, I say this inductively with confidence, even without precise clarity. Right. So it seems as if there are people who walk into the challenge, as you described, sort of step into the fear. In Abraham's case, Abraham Lincoln's case, go beyond his own despair uh, and rise to the challenge. And there are others who shrink in the face of challenge. What, what role does character play? in differentiating those two sets of individuals, do you think? So, so, you know, I see character as being a lot like, you know, courage and resilience. You build it up. You, I don't think we're, most of us are born with a kind of perfectly formed, noble character or the opposite of that. I, I You know, Lincoln's character evolved toward, toward much more moral seriousness and much more, if you will, tenacity about what the war meant after he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. I mean, there were all these different inflection points for Lincoln along the war where a person who, you know, always wanted to make an impact. I mean, he wanted to be famous in politics since, like, you know, since he was 20, 21, running for state legislator out of Sagamon County in the, in the center of Illinois. Um, but but that, that kind of ambition, even tethered to I want to make the world better, is 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 vague and also narcissistically driven and then he gets to the white house and he realizes what the stakes are you know when god wants to punish you he answers your prayers and so lincoln's journey in the white house is this extraordinary iterative messy two steps forward half a step back kind of building of this character of i have a i i, I am i'm a steward of, a, of of the nation at an extraordinary time we have to transform the nation. This is 1862. He's not wanting to do this in 1861. I'm going to get rid of the cancer of slavery. And then we've got to hold the line and fight for unconditional surrender from the South because that's all that will do. It will, that's what it takes to get this, this, this war fought and the country transformed. And then I'll use every chip I had for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And that growth into moral seriousness, to me, Suzanne, is a growth and evolution and strengthening of what became a moral, serious, ultimately, you know, humble character that simply wasn't, the, the seeds were there, but the tree hadn't bloomed, grown up and blossomed until we get to the, to, to the end of the war. And then uh, tragically, tragically, he shot as he's really found his kind of core muscles of purpose and courage. Um, and, you know, I think, so I think character is often built, in, and, and it's often built, let's get back to some of the things you've talked a lot about in these in this series, it's often built by people find, built more, more intensely and built more solidly by people finding a purpose, 
that they regard as worthy. You know, uh, when I was raising money for the Harvard Business School many years ago, I went and interviewed A.G. Laffley, who was then the CEO of Procter & Gamble for the first time. He would go on to be CEO a second time in subsequent years. And he was a Lincoln scholar, and we got talking about the making of leaders. And he said this. He said, leadership, leaders are, he said, leaders are made, they're not born, and they're made of these three ingredients. Nature and nurture in equal measure, you know, the, what you're born with, what you accumulate in terms of mileage as you walk your path. Um, a moment arises, these last two parts are important for character, a moment arises, second ingredient, that the individual recognizes, demands their leadership. Third ingredient, the individual has to decide for him or herself in a very serious, kind of almost covenant-like way, I'm going to get in the game. I'm all in. And I think those last two are what are really important to shaping character. You find, you sniff a purpose. You, you think, you look up, you, you, you're drawn to it. And then you say, this is for me. This is meaningful. This is worthy. This is important. I believe this is goodness. And once, you're, once you kind of tether your ship to, or, or you know, navigate your ship to that star, I think the potential for your character to grow in ways that are not only incredibly satisfying and grounding for you, but incredibly important for the world, is magnified very significantly. Great. So this is super helpful in the relationship between character and purpose. Um, in, again, in the Lincoln chapter, you, you've referenced his narcissism. And it, <laughs> it seems that, you know, if you asked him early on, he had a sense of purpose entirely t tied to his own self-interest. And so what seems really important in how you define purpose then is this outwardly directed sense of purpose. Um, you, you talk about goodness, for example. Yes. So it needs to be beyond yourself. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, I mean, all right, so let's just, so let me just Again, go back to the example, because historians work almost completely by examples, right? We're like detectives. Here's a breadcrumb, here's a breadcrumb, here's a... So think about John Lewis, just for a second, the congressman and civil rights activist that, that passed away about 10 days ago. So it, I met him, actually, in 2017 when he, we gave him an award at the Kennedy School, and I got to spend the evening on, on a kind of, or spend an hour on a fireside chat with him. He's luminous. Like, you meet him, and he exudes this kind of, a lot like Oprah Winfrey or... Or you know Martin Luther King, or um, you know Marion Wright Edelman, or Melinda Gates. I mean, these are people who just wrote, they just exude this sense of I'm standing here and I'm headed here, and this is who I am. And yes, there was certainly narcissism that propelled all those people a certain way along the journey. But what's really interesting, and this is something I think we should talk about more in professional schools, is this is not what we talk about at Harvard Business School very much at all. And what's really interesting in the case of all the, almost all the people I've studied, and this was true of Frederick Douglass from all the first hand accounts we have of meeting him and watching him speak and being in his presence, is that, that, that the I, I need to do this, here's my fuel tank, this is on my bucket list, here's what I do next, here's when I make partner, here's when I get, you know, when I own the firm, or here's when I, you know, ha have a place at the law firm. That that I, when you discover something that has this larger component for, for decency in the world, the I becomes that. That's a language from Martin Buber, a German theologian of the early 20th century. The I becomes that. And then it's like this burst of, you know, just incandescent light inside. And that and, and you meet these people, I, I can say this with great confidence with Lewis. I mean, he knew exactly what he was up to, what he was doing, why he was here. And the combination of that anchoring and that, you know, ability to connect with people about that purpose was absolutely unresistible, irresistible. You just couldn't, you just wanted to be there with him. And I think, I think that's what we're talking about. So, so that, so that it's, it's purpose, it's connection, it's, but it's, it's not that the self is absent, it's the self has found its true power in relation to what it can do for we. And that, my, my dear friends, those are the real ruby slippers. That is the most, that is true, true power. And, and you know it when you've been in the presence of these people or heard them speak and you, you see it inside them. But you can't get it off nap. You can't get it off a diploma. You've got to find it for yourself and then work on building it. So what, what do we do in professional education then to cultivate that, to nurture that? 
um, right? We, we can't manufacture crises to help people nope. navigate through them to figure out how they find this sense of greater purpose. I, in your own experience at Harvard Business School and elsewhere in executive training, are there ways to enable this that you've seen that have been effective? Well, I, one of the things I've noticed at HBS all these years, I've been there about 26 years now, is the power of our students being exposed to leaders like someone like Lewis, and and, or Darren Walker. It doesn't, it's not just, right? So I'm not just talking about civil rights activists or, or kind of moral crusaders. There are a lot of different leaders um, of all kinds of elks, uh, Oprah Winfrey, exposed to them and exposed not just to you know how much money they make or what kind of impact they've had, but also what was their journey. Right? You have to, in a sense, kind of lift the shade up on the resume story, I think, for people to get at this, to realize that ordinary people become extraordinary by working on themselves. And part of that work is finding something that really matters to you that, that and deeply satisfying, deeply engaging, um, that you believe is important for the world believe from the best part of yourself and, and that's not doesn't preclude you know material comforts it doesn't preclude you know social standing but you understand that when you when you've stumbled into this place the whole game is different like howard schultz founding starbucks there's a man who found his purpose and then lost it when he ran for president um because you know you, you don't get a lock hold on, on what you're doing with your time and your energy and and your north star so so i think exposure to not just well-known, well-heeled, interesting, famous people, but the the backstory, the shade up on their life story is really important. Um, and the struggles, the real struggles. See, we don't do a, a very good job at HBS, and I think it's true law professionals, or most law schools don't do any of this, talking about, you know, how did how did certain lawyers become who they are and become and and, and do what they do? And we don't we don't really talk about failures or disappointments or setbacks or or the things that are important for forging us and what that relationship has, to, what those experiences have to do with one's career. Because one's career is never one's career. One's career is a piece, a big piece in most professional schools of one's life. So I think we need to be more integrated and we need to be um, more nosy and we need to be more willing to look at, you know, what Brene Brown wants to talk about, you know, shame and vulnerability and, and the, the things that bring us to our knees and how they make us different and better and more and more and, and, and people capable of having more impact. Great. That's super helpful. Um, so enter COVID. Uh, the world is now very different than when you wrote the book. Um, has your, you know, sort of your core argument is this notion of a steadfast commitment to a larger purpose. Um, has your argument about leadership changed at all? Has it been reinforced? And you mentioned Andrew Cuomo. Are there individuals who you see as really rising to this challenge in, in the ways that your own work would have predicted? Uh, that's, you know, thank you for asking that question. That's an, a, it's kind of a dream question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. Uh, and I do a lot of talking about crisis, the COVID crisis right now. Um, so let me just say one other thing about the argument in the book. The argument in the book is about moving the boulder of goodness forward, people that did this and that, that became who they needed to become to do that in a personal crisis. So there's five different personal crises that help shape these people, and they're all long-term crises. Um, but the other piece of the argument is that they did that, they moved that boulder forward, whether we're talking about Frederick Douglass or Rachel Carson with Silent Spring or a, a German theologian who's a force story, and in some ways the most poignant. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a resistor in Nazi Germany, or Aaron Shackleton, chapter one, or story one. The argument is that the way they did that began with a, a healthy slug, perhaps even, that's not even a fair word, a healthy stock of emotional awareness that they were, that they paid attention to long before, in the case of Lincoln, or Douglas, before anyone was using those words. Emotional awareness, and then the willingness to take that emotional awareness, right, and figure out what are the things in a crisis I need to work on to, to, to get through this and get stronger, right? I'm gonna make some lemonade out of these lemons. And, and, and it, it's never that precise or that clear, but you can see it very clearly in the primary sources that that's what's happening. So, so that's, I think that's really important. And, and 
let me just list some of those uh, those those attributes, which we all are all attributes we can attain and and, and make stronger. So resilience, self discipline, exceptionally important in our age. Um, uh, Courage, which, as Mandela said, is never the absence of fear. It's the willingness to walk into the fear and realize you've still got other things to do, even standing there in the fear, and you can do them. Um, so courage. Uh, ultimately, empathy plays a huge role. Um, and, and a few others, but those are the most important ones. So COVID, uh, to me, seems no different. I mean, we need our leaders to be able to harness their own discipline, resilience, courage, empathy, which seems to me in far shorter supply than I would have expected with a with a national crisis that is now costing getting upwards of 150,000 deaths. I've heard very few leaders talk about what that means to have lost a close family or, or, or friend in this crisis. Um, but but anyway, I think those things are incredibly important and they're important not just for the leader who's got to show up right without being able to say, oh, my God, like Cuomo was April 10th. I have no idea how we're going to get through this, I, but he can't say that. Show up, say, here's what we got. Here's how many people are hospitalized. Here's what ICU capacity is. Here's how many new cases are. Here's what we're doing about the ventilator shortage. Here's how we're triaging patients between hospitals. Here's what's happening to EMTs, EMT calls. I mean, you know, that combination that he kept doing, that all crisis leaders do, of brutal honesty and credible hope, that was partly about self-discipline and information gathering. It was also about resilience. 102 consecutive press conferences, and, 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 and it was also about, in every single press briefing, great reserves of empathy for those that were sick and those that had lost loved ones. Um, and, and by doing that, here's the key thing. It's not just that it's a good thing to do that and you need those things to do that as a leader. It's that you then help other people access their discipline. So today, on Twitter and on his uh, government webpage, Cuomo is on fire about mask wearing and social distancing at all these places that New York, like every other state, is having trouble, right, ensuring compliance now that there's different stages of reopening. So, so I have, so yes, the things that made those ordinary people do extraordinary things in forged in crisis are the same qualities, I think, largely that are incredibly important for leaders in, in, in COVID, they're also incredibly important for leaders to communicate those to ordinary Americans. Cuomo, Jacinda Ardern, let me just mention a few people that most of us haven't, the Prime Minister of New Zealand haven't been paying attention to. Um, Gretchen Whitmer, uh, the governor of Michigan, um, uh, a series of Angela Merkel, who we thought, many of us who study leaders, was going to fade now into a kind of strange, but politically generated kind of, you know, mist in history, based largely on her immigration policies and the rise of a much more uh, ra a radical right in Germany. And guess what? She's going to leave the stage, as Jerry Lee Lewis said, you know, having them ask for more, asking for more, because she's been so successful as a COVID leader. So leader leading Germany through COVID. And, and so I, I think there's all kinds of people that have, that have come out of, of, Brian Stevenson, who's always, if you've been following him, founder, co-founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, if you've been following him, always a courageous leader, you know, someone whose moment has arrived, it seems to me, in terms of the campaign for justice and equality and, uh, you know, a host of other people. Um, but yes, yes, the same qualities, uh, ordinary people rising, making them skills capable of doing extraordinary things and not only inspiring, but also instructing us about what we need to do here. Yeah, it's great. I think the the case of Andrew Cuomo really reinforces the, the Wallace definition in really great ways. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's play a little bit with your argument. Um, yeah. So I, since I first read the book, I've been wondering who else was a candidate to be in the book? <laughs> and why are they there, right? So sure. clearly there are other exemplars you could have drawn on. Why this particular set? Um, largely because, as a colleague of mine at the business school said, you know, you don't finish a book, you abandon it. Because I had spent about <laughs> about 14 years working on the book, and if I'd done two more people or three more people, it would have been 22 years. I'm a very, very slow writer. Part of the reason the book's readable is partly because I'm 
I, I draft and redraft and redraft to make it easy. So you, it's easy for the reader, but hard for the writer. Um, so other people on the list were Winston Churchill and I just decided too much written about Winston Churchill. And there was lots written about Lincoln, but Lincoln, for personal reasons, I had to include. Um, Catherine Graham was on my on my watch list. And I've taught a lot about her because there's now a generation of young women at Harvard, both undergraduates and professional school students, who until the movie, right, didn't know, um, didn't know anything about her. And even in the movie with Meryl Streep playing her, you don't get a sense of what the extraordinary transformation was from where Catherine Graham was in the early 1960s when after her husband killed himself in her home, she was alone on a Sunday afternoon in their Virginia home. He shot himself after terrible, scarring, um, astoundingly difficult moment for her for all kinds of reasons I won't presume to indulge myself with with you folks on. But but she did, what she did in the eight or nine years as after she keep, decides to keep her father's paper that her her husband had, had become the sole uh, manager and editor of, or publisher of, she, what happens in the next eight years is truly astounding. Fast forward to the Pentagon Papers and that scene in the movie of, or, in, or in her life when she says nervously, go ahead and publish. Um, and then Watergate and a host of other things. I mean, what an astounding leader that, that like Rachel Carson, just belies the idea that great leaders are, are charismatic hard-charging, great public speakers, great leaders, are not, not necessarily any of those things. They come in all shapes and sizes. So Catherine Graham was on the list. Churchill was on the list. Um, a couple of other abolitionists were on the list because I, I got very, very interested in the early abolitionist movement. Um, and I just, in the end, Nelson Mandela, who I'm, I'm also now doing a lot of research about because I had done a lot for the book, and then just said, okay, I, I got to get this done before I, you know, before, before I retire. So. Okay, great. Um, in, in many interviews and in your writing, you've been very honest and upfront about your own personal challenges in life. Uh, who, was, who has inspired you in your difficult times and who is inspiring to you now? Do you have a mentor or, or an exemplar that you sort of use as a touchstone in challenging times personally? Um, so just for the listener or for our viewers or participants who don't know, I. I I went. My, I was. I was. I was forged in crisis. There's a real personal story to this. The beginning of this book, which was I had just written this case on Ernest Shackleton for the Harvard Business School, and I was just putzing around with some other ideas. And then, in in, in about a year, my father died. My husband of 15, almost 15 years, 14 years, walked out on me one night, and then I got cancer. And then I got cancer again, and there was just some other terrible things that happened. It was a terrible four-year patch, um, and I. I, I think I ended up stumbling into this work on Lincoln. I never studied Lincoln at all. I was a European historian trained at Harvard many years ago. And, and I, I think I was inspired by his strength because he had so many challenges, both personally and publicly as president. Um, and I was, and how did he keep going? I was, just, I was reading about Lincoln asking myself, how did he do this? How did he keep going? How did he keep rising? What can I learn? I was like soaking it up like, you know, like a sponge. Um, so he is, he still inspires me. I have a lot of fear. I write a lot about fear because, and I work with people on fear because I have a lot of fear. Um, and I found Ernest Shackleton and to be incredibly inspiring any given day for me with fear. Um, you know, walk, tighten your core muscles, walk in one small step. You're still standing, right? Square your shoulders, take the next step. Um, so I find him incredibly inspiring. I'm very, very, I'm absolutely lost in research right now on, on, on the early civil rights movement. This is early, so this is 58, 59, not the very earliest. The Montgomery boycott, real bus boycott really gets going in 1955. But, but 58, 59, 60 and 61. Um, that's a freedom rise of 60, 61. And I'm re meeting now a much fuller cast of characters than I knew about. I knew about King and I certainly knew about what we call the big six, which by the way, that term, which we read a lot about when uh, Congressman Lewis died, was actually not about the big six of the civil rights movement. They never thought of themselves as the big six. Those were the six men who were in charge of organizing the March on Washington, representing groups as diverse as the Urban League, the NAACP, and students, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So, so I, I, I'm looking at people other than just the people we all know, and including the people we all And it is so incredibly inspiring um, because it's so hard. 
And it's so much harder than about 99% of Americans know. And they, it was, they were so brave and they were, and they were so well disciplined and so trained and James Lawson and non, nonviolent strategy was just so extraordinarily fine tuned. It is, it, it is just, I can't get over it. So right now those, those men and men, men and women, women, uh, for those of you that are kind of looking for someone to look up, take a look at Ella Baker, right? Or a host of other women that were just part of this and just, just really making a huge difference. So those people inspire me and what they did under the conditions in fighting a still to me inexplicable hatred. It's not just racism, it's, it's hatred and, and cruelty. I, 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 I'm, I'm so inspired by it. Um, okay, related question, sort of a first date or a classroom icebreaker. If you could <laughs> invite any three people alive or dead to dinner, who would they be and why? And what kind of character do you associate with them? You only get three. I'd invite, I'd surely invite Mr. Lincoln because he could tell a story or two. And if the conversation, you know, kind of ebbed, he'd step in with a, you know, with a, with an aw shock story. So that I'd just be interested <laughs> to be in his presence. I know him so, so very well. So certainly Lincoln. Um, I might invite Bono because I have this terrible crush that I can't get over on the U2 singer. And I actually wrote a Harvard Business School case indulging my crush about him in 2009. Got very close to interviewing him twice. Didn't happen in one case because Pavar Pavarotti died and he had to go to the funeral the day I was to meet him. But but Bono, because his mind is so fine and he's he has spent some of his life, even in the glittery, you know, cage of superstardom fame, he's spent some part of his life on on a larger mission. I'd like to ask him, I'd like to get him back on that larger mission right here, right now. Come on, Bono, the world needs you. So maybe Bono, and then we need to have a really interesting woman. And I don't, I'm not sure it would be Rachel Carson. Um, you know, I probably, I might invite George Eliot because even though she wasn't, you know, a compelling speaker, that wasn't her job, she's such a lens into what makes people tick and what, and what the true satisfactions, the iterative, small satisfactions of living a connected life are. And that's what she writes about. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe that would be an interesting combo. Bono, Lincoln, George Eliot, right? Maybe, maybe she has to bring Henry Luz in as well because I don't think she went out socially without him, but that's another story. Okay, great. Um, so now the rapid fire uh, segment where I'm gonna throw out a name and these are folks you've either written cases about or are starting to write work on. Yeah. If you could just give me a character trait you associate with them. So yeah. let's start with Bono. Uh, Lightning, fire, intelligence, and social commitment. Great. Oprah. Big, big fire, a great light within. Henry Hines. <laughs> Look out for your people, and they'll, they'll make your business successful. Uh, Estee Lauder. Darling, have best saleswoman in the world. Have I got some cream for you? You have such beautiful cheekbones. Let me put that on right now, make you even more beautiful. Great saleswoman, a great sales warmth. <laughs> Madam Walker. Oh, babe, we can do this. We can not only sell hair products to every African American woman in the country, we can change the world in their, with their, it changed their social and socioeconomic prospects and we can do it right here, right now. Let me go show you how. Uh, Josiah Wedgwood. Oh God, oh God. What? What makes people buy things? So this a great sense of consumer empathy that translated into the first, the world's first commercial brand, consumer empathy before anyone knew what a consumer was or what empathy was or a brand. Great. And the last one is Greta Thunberg. Fiery determination, right? From her toes up. And this is a, an ordinary person who has had a great number of difficulties and boy, did she find her purpose. You want to talk about growth folks? She's exhibit A for my, for my, for my theory and my proposition. Great. Um, and then before we transition to audience questions, 
What's the one thing you're most hopeful about at this moment? It can be a personal thing, a social, societal thing. You pick it. So the, the tectonic plate of the American experiment have only opened up a few times, tectonic plates, I use my language carefully, but only a few times in moments, I mean, over a space span of say 10, 12 years, when, when, the, when the promise of America was actually real, could actually be realized. It's only happened a few times. It happened after the Civil War for more than five years, but less than 15. It happened beginning in about 1962 in this country. Uh, continuing, but then, but then, like as in about 1870, those plates closed again. Without those, the, the the infrastructure of that promise, all men and women are created equal, being built on and then and built on some more. So this is another such moment in the midst of great death and destruction and some of the most immoral and incompetent leadership the modern world has ever seen. All within our shores, our shining from sea to shining sea. Even in the midst of all that, the plates have opened again. And even amidst, you know, a great, a, a extraordinary effort by, uh, by the administration to try and quell the, the voices that are demanding that those tectonic plates keep moving. So I'm very, very hopeful about that. It will take, however, my friends, a lot of systemic work, and it's far greater than pulling down Confederate monuments. As important as that is, that's just, that's a tiny, tiny baby step. There's about 25 other bigger steps that we have to be ready to start taking now. Great, thank you for that. I'm gonna to transition to audience questions. And the first one is, as a professor, what can we do in this moment of remote education to help this be a formative moment for our students rather than just something to suffer through? Yeah, that's a great question. So I like to think of, I like to think of this, these, the COVID moment and the consequent crises, right? Some of which have been, in the case of the campaign for equality and justice, been, been simmering, brewing for some time, but have broken open with new, with new possibilities with COVID, because of COVID. So COVID, econo massive economic fallout, terrible destructive economic fallout, um, with some compensations, you know, but quieter, more time at home, et cetera. So it's not without, it's not unmitigated. And then the campaign for equality and justice. So in, in, those, in, the, in those crises, um, they're seismic events. You gotta stop thinking this is normal or that we are in a normal situation where suddenly classroom education has taken this terrible hit called Zoom. I like to start thinking, okay, we're living through a war. The enemy is a very effective, very, very ruthlessly efficient virus, which just seeks more hosts anywhere it goes. And it's very good at it when, you, when, when other things aren't, aren't, when barriers aren't put in front of it. Um, so, so in that moment, if we're living through a war, and it's, it's probably a two year proposition, so if we just start recalibrating the frame from oh this happened it should be done by now to oh this is a real this is a world changing event that we will everything will be different from there's no new normal my friends there's the post war covid world that we're making that's a very different thing new normal versus post covid world the latter is what we have no doubt about it so then okay so it, it's war time what does education mean well education might mean what do we learn about crisis leadership, right? That's a, and what does that mean for our formation? A lot of people like my parents that came through World War II talked about it as a formative event. What are the things we're doing as educators to help our students start thinking about that? Secondly, what are the things that we can do as young people privileged to have higher education or, or secondary school education, but particularly higher education, to actually play a part in, in helping the vulnerable, even in our virtual world. I'd love to see college and second and, and, and graduate school giving credit for initiatives around shoring up public health, increasing voter registration, delivering food. We have thousands and thousands of the country's smart young minds and all that energy, let's put it to work now and give our students educational credit for it. So we're forming character, pursuing missions and making society a better place. Realign supply chains for PPE. There's 
there are countless things that need to be done. There are young minds and energy to do them. Let, maybe we should stop thinking, boy, it's really not interesting to study the classics on Zoom. And what can we do on Zoom right now in this crucible of this crisis to make ourselves and the larger world better? That's great. So I, I really appreciate, in, in some sense, you're advocating for the kind of creativity uh, the individuals in your book put forward to say, let's not stick with the same plan and try to make do, but reimagine a new plan and a new future. So that's great. Um, another question about education. How do we reimagine education at this time to better include the most vulnerable um, they seem to be the ones most apt to be left behind. How do we better engage and reach? Um, you know, again, I think a combination of creativity and and good information. So, my students at HBS, my MBA students, are really smart. Most of them are t very decent. Most of them wanna, you know, add their patch add their own patch to the quilt of human decency and contribution. Um, but I don't think most of my students, for example, know very much about, say, vulnerable secondary and primary schools, school kids, and, and how many don't have internet, and where they don't have hookups, and how many, ki how many kids are hungry. I'll bet most of my, my HBS students, even today, don't know how many children in America hungry it's between one and four and one and five according to the latest information that we have so first we have to educate uh our, our people on, on on what vulnerable means and then we have to say okay we're going to form ourselves into teams and figure out hmm, how could we sitting here in our homes or in our dorm rooms logging in you know gather resources or figure out a way to get internet access to those schools or those kids there's ways to do almost everything. And if I have learned anything studying leaders in 25 years, it's that they are master improvisers, master inventors, all of this a long way of saying how creativity is at the font, at the source of a lot of this. So I think we need, and how do we, how do we you know, reorganize another food, since the federal government isn't really willing to redistribute food as it did say in the Great Depression and part of the New Deal, how do we, how do we, reorganize certain food supply chains. If you just do one, it would make a major difference from a set of farmers in Nebraska with too many hogs to a set of kids that are hungry in Missouri with no pork. How do we do that? Everyone on this call could gather five people together and figure out how to do that in about three weeks and get it in, get it in motion. That's what we, that's the kind of work. Educate ourselves about what vulnerability is and precisely where there are people we could help and then set ourselves the task of trying to do that. This is hardly, hardly impossible. It's highly possible. Great. Okay, so a question uh, that brings us back to character and virtue. How are virtues like courage forged in crisis connected to other virtues that we might need in leadership? So you, you talked about several others, including empathy. How do, how do they interrelate? Um, that's a good question. You know, I, when I think about someone like Mandela, who, you know, and actually in, in the case of what happened after Nick Mandela was released, the clerk as well, because the two of them make possible, right, what happens that's so important in the Republic of South Africa. When I think about Mandela, I think, you know, he discovered his courage. You build, you build each of these things by increments. I mean, that's what's so, strike, so striking to me. So Mandela gets braver and braver. Um, through even his jail time, really, particularly in the first three or four years. Um, and, and, and then at the same time, he learns to have empathy for his guards. So it's almost like the, the, the crisis puts these possibilities before people and they walk toward them and access them. And then they use them in the next crisis or in the next failure or the next disappointment. So I see a lot of these tools, particularly courage and resilience. Empathy may be a little bit less so, but again, empathy is not something you can acquire and, 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 and make stronger rather than something you need to have been born with. But I see both of these things, particularly resilience and courage as being things that you, 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 you access. Um, and with resilience, let me just say this, because it's important for everyone, I think, to hear this. This is not my work. This is the work of the kind of pioneering sociologist on resilience, which is a guy named Martin Seligman, who's still active. 
uh, but wrote the early er, the, the the pioneering work on why how do people get resilient? Well, you get resilient. The, the beginnings of it are how you explain the crisis, or how you explain the failure, or how you explain the disappointment, or how you explain the cancer, right? How do you explain it? Is it your problem? Is it going to define the rest of your life? Is it your fault? Is it because you're you? Or is there something that is largely impersonal about it that you can navigate through and that you can learn something in, right? Box number one, box number two, depending on which you choose, has a great deal to do with how you weather resilience. And once you weather it, how you get stronger in the course of it. Not everyone gets stronger. Some people can weather without strengthening, but most people have trouble even getting to, I'm gonna weather this. So all these things, Suzanne, are, are, are things that people stumble on, most of them, discover and then say, like Lincoln did say, and in, in, you know, in, in the first year of the White House, well, you know, it was really bad. It was really terrible at first Manassas, but now we're in second Manassas, and here are some of the things I did to get myself out of bed, because he got, he had lots of points when he was really, really depressed during the war, and a couple of points where he threatened to kill himself. Um, and, and, and so, what got me through a year ago, I can call on those same things to get me through again. And so the muscle gets stronger. Okay, good. Um, you spoke of the importance of exposure to good leaders, learning from their experience, both the good times and the bad. What advice would you give to someone in early stage career looking for a mentor or an exemplar? Um, are these figures in books? How do we find them in, in person? Uh, it's harder. It's much harder in person, but 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 do do a lot of detective work in books and you know and in in, in your in research first, right? Because that's going to get that's going to tell you what you're drawn to, right? So so you know John Lewis, for example, wrote to Martin Luther King. It wasn't actually King who sent him the bus ticket. I know everyone said that, but that's not exactly how it worked. But he wrote to Martin Luther King. He never met King. But he was a he was a college student in well, he was a young man in Troy, Alabama, and King was on the radio, and he loved King's sermons. And so he doesn't know King, but he writes to King, and and then some other folks send him a bus ticket, and then King meets him, and he actually becomes part of a circle around King, much less central in in, in King's workings initially, and then later much more part of King's world. But but my point is, he had actually you know snooped around and thought a lot. About about what he was what he thought was important, and then he found someone on the radio. So it doesn't matter how you find them, but the research, even about people that are that aren't living any longer, will tell you what you admire in, in certain people. That's important. And then and then you're much better off going to look for someone that in your world that can help you. And do not be afraid to do the John Lewis you know attack, which is I'm going to write someone. I'm going to write someone. You're you know, if it's someone super famous, they may not respond, or someone very, very busy, they may not respond. But some people do, and a host of really interesting leaders have gotten their start by reaching out to someone far distant and far beyond their ideas of what they, of the light of the world they lived in. So do your research and then look around and, and don't settle. You don't have to have a living, breathing mentor be incredibly successful. You're much better off with you know a men someone you admire that isn't actually actively talking to you on a regular basis if that person isn't a strong and inspirational and courageous and morally serious individual don't settle you can shape yourself without someone meeting you twice a month in in office hours if they're not worthy and they're not serious and they're not good great thank you um next question uh, you talked about uh, the sense of greater purpose when the I becomes the we or the I becomes the thou. Um, how can we concretely explore that sense of greater purpose in life, right? So how do we, you know, and this is a question we asked Angela Duckworth early on talking about grit because she talks about purpose as well. How do you find that sense of purpose? How, how do you find the place that you are animated by, committed to, and driven toward? Uh, look up and look out. So um, I'm a horseback rider and I took up riding late in life when my life started falling apart because I thought it was going to make me feel worthy. It didn't. That was, you know, I, that was a pipe dream anyway. But, but I took it up and I love animals and horses turn out to be master teachers, uh, partly because they're so intuitive and, um, and you actually have to have, find some self-discipline, a great deal of self-discipline and empathy to ride them. 
Um, but in any event, I, I, early on, I would I would ride like this, as all older riders do, because you're scared. And I started jumping, and you jump the jumps, and you ride like this, like this. And, and that's no way to ride. You want to ride like this, right? Looking out, looking up, looking ahead. And a trainer once said to me, uh, she wasn't a very good trainer, but she this was very this is apt for your for your question. You don't ride the jumps; you ride the path. So to find a purpose that's meaningful to you, you have to kind of be out here. That's not your phone, and it's not what's on the board necessarily at Career Services as important or on the on the website at Career Services as important as those notices are. You gotta look and smell and feel. I mean, I have known people that have stumbled into their purpose as like arts people who, who who help art museum directors raise you know raise money and structure themselves because they love great painting. So it's about knowing yourself and looking out into the world and listening and scoping, right, peering for something that makes your heart sing. Something that, as Oliver Wendell Holmes said when he was describing 20 years after the Civil War and what made those Union soldiers want to fight, he said, our hearts were touched by fire. You want something out there that touches your heart by fire, touches your heart with fire, and then and then you take the next step towards it, and that's how you start unpacking and unpacking something that might be highly meaningful, highly grounding, highly satisfying and enjoyable for you. By the way, it's also something you're likely to excel at because we do very well when we're, when we're, when we're, te- we've tethered our star, our, our ship to a star that we really think is highly important and meaningful. Great. Um, sort of any final thoughts for, people who are starting to look up, starting to look forward and explore a path, just as we so, close up. Yeah, uh, so a couple of things. First, don't worry if you haven't found your purpose yet. You just keep looking. The, lo- the search itself is highly gratifying and it will put you in touch because you'll be looking for people that are driven by purpose with people that will, that will, that will, you will learn from, you will grow from and you will enjoy, and you will enjoy being associated with or enjoy learning from. So don't don't stop looking and don't worry if you haven't found it and don't you know don't don't try and prepackage yourself into a purpose. Just look, look up, ride the path, not the jumps, uh, and don't don't settle for I'm going to get my I'm going to be partner in seven years. That's not enough. And you know owning your own company at forty isn't enough unless you're you know helping cure cancer. Let's do something that's successful that also makes the world meaningfully better because. Here the, now the last couple of things to say. The world has never needed you more than it does right now. And it, and you're young, but it will never need you more than it does now. Why? Because this, these seismic events don't come along every generation. They only come along every 65 or 70 years, even in our accelerated, highly compressed information tsunami moment. So this is your moment. So don't settle. Don't, 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 don't believe that transactional is as far, as far as you need to go or as good as it gets, it gets a whole lot better. Um, and, and humility and decency and finding a purpose and a group of people that share your priorities in terms of what you want to do with your talents and the success you're building, that's the real good stuff, right? This is all, these are all part of living the good life, right? As Plato or John Lewis or Bono <laughs> or a host or, you know, or my horse trainer would say. So go forth. This is your moment. Great. And with that uh, bit of aspiration and inspiration, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us here at Duke um, and those who spent this lunch hour with you. So thanks hugely for joining us. Um, and for those listening in, please join us next week at noon for a journalist and author of The Power of Meaning, Emily Esfani Smith. Um, Please see the virtuesandvocations.org for a full lineup of the series. And I wanna conclude with a very special thanks to the Kern Family Foundation for their support of the series. And thank you, Nancy, this was great fun. Oh, my pleasure, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Have a wonderful afternoon. And you.